Hi, this is Jill Schlesinger, host of the Better Off podcast. On today's episode, Mohammed El Aryan. We're talking about big picture stuff, monetary policy, the stuff the Fed does, fiscal policy, what the politicians can do, and of course, everyone's favorite topic, taxes. It's very important to understand that there's an efficiency element to the tax system, but there's also a very important redistributive element to the budgets and fiscal policy. So you need to combine both. And I think you can. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast, sponsored by Betterment, the smarter way to invest your money. Today, we have one of my favorite people who I have met since this new career in media, Mohammed El Aryan. Now, Mohammed, you may have seen him on various TV outlets or read his work. The thing I love about him is he actually takes economics, big picture stuff, boils it down in a way that everyone can understand. And it's so fantastic. And he's so smart. Now, he also has this really wild phrase that he and his PIMCO, this is a firm he used to work for, he and his PIMCO colleagues actually coined the phrase the new normal to describe what they thought was likely to be a slow growth economic recovery after the financial crisis and the recession. What's amazing is how long and sluggish this period would be. Mohammed actually saw that. And I'm wondering what else he sees. That's why we're bringing him on the show right now. Before we get to the interview, just a quick favor. Could you hop on to betteroffpodcast.com and take our survey? Mark says it takes literally a few minutes. That's it. Fill it out. Gives us a better understanding of what you want, what you don't want, and want your feedback. So betteroffpodcast.com or look for a link in the show notes. And now my interview with Mohammed El Aryan. By the way, this is just part one. Part two with Mohammed will be next week. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Okay, it's time for the Better Off interview segment. Special guest star today, Dr. Mohammed El Aryan, the chief economic advisor at Allianz, the former chair of President Obama's Global Development Council. You may have heard of him, seen him on TV. He was the chief executive and co-chief investment officer at PIMCO, the global investment management firm. Now, what does he do? He just sits back, writes. He's a FT contributing editor, Bloomberg View columnist. Uh, he was named one of LinkedIn's best influencers in 2015 and 2016. The beautiful paperback version of The Only Game in Town, Central Bank's Instability and Avoiding the Next Collapse will be out next month in paperback. Go get it. Mohammed El Aryan, welcome to Better Off. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for having me on. Oh, great. You know, we start every single interview with a uh, question. You're going to laugh now. You ready? Ready. What's the best money decision you ever made? That's a good one. Um, probably the best money decision I ever made was to bet on PIMCO at a time when others were not um, comfortable doing so, and that proved to be a very good decision. Why did you want to do that? You was that what, where were you before? You did Solomon Brothers a hundred years ago, but then weren't you also at Harvard doing the endowment for a little bit? So first, I was in the public sector. I was the, at the IMF in Washington, and I was turning forty, and I had realized that I had never experienced the private sector. So I thought, why not try it? So I went to Solomon at the time in London, which was quite a shock to the system. And then I got this call on a cold November rainy day in London saying that there was this asset management firm out in California that wanted to interview me for a position there. And I thought, great, I'd never been to California and it sounds sunny and off I went and I met the smartest people that I had ever come across and I decided that this would be a great place to learn and it was. And was, wasn't there, was there a Harvard thing in there between? There was. So up until 2006, I was at PIMCO. Then I got the dream call of being able to combine investment management, which I love, with the academic world that I loved and at one point had aspired to. And I got a call from Harvard and I met them. And I did that for almost two years until coming back to PIMCO. Okay. And when you look at your training, which is a deep, you've got deep economics. I mean, the doctor is because, not because you are a medical doctor, it is because you are have studied this. How did you see economics playing into the investment world? Where was the collision there? So I think if you want to be a good investor, it's often said you need three things. You need an understanding of fundamentals, which is what economics brings you. 
Second, you need an understanding of mathematics, especially discounted cash flows, et cetera. And third, you need, need a gut instinct. You need to understand what market technicals are going to do, what human behavior is going to lead investors to do. So economics is part of the three things you need, and the key issue is to supplement it with the others. And that's why a team approach to investment is so important, because very few people have all three. Do you think that Warren Buffett you know, has all three? Is it that these two guys operating on their own can run this massive conglomerate with those three backgrounds? Or, what, or is it different for them because they have an infinite time horizon? So I think it helps having permanent capital because you can do things that other people cannot do. And permanent capital or the patience is one of the things that is really lacking right now. Um, so they do have a structural advantage, but I also think that they do combine the three things that I mentioned, and they've done so repeatedly. There's a handful of people who are, who have done so, um, but it's rare to find it in one or two people. You normally need a team to, to deliver it. As you look back and you see the the landscape shifting, and you see every single report come out and say, like, be a passive investor. Warren Buffett said, be a passive investor. Be a passive investor. How do you come at that? when you think about your background? I mean, obviously, you come from a structure where you think, in certain sectors at the very least, that you can do better being a active investor. So make sense of that for the listeners. So there's an inconvenient truth about active investment, which is at the end of the day, it's a zero-sum game, meaning for everybody that outperforms, that's someone that's un- that underperforms. So if you're going to be an active investor, if you're going to pick active managers you better know who you're picking. And that's really important um, because half, at least half, in fact, higher if you put in fees, but at least half of the active universe is going to underperform. Where active investment makes sense is in imperfect asset classes. So if I'm investing in the S&P 500, I wouldn't go through an active channel. So unless, don't, don't buy a growth fund, buy the index fund. Correct, unless you have reason to believe that the active investor, she or he, really brings value, and that's hard. But if I'm going to invest in high-yield bonds or in emerging market bonds, I'd be very careful going the passive way. First, there's problems with the construction of the index. And secondly, you really do need to pick your spots. So I think that there's a place for passive investment and there's a place for active investment. I think that makes sense because I was just talking to um, a guy who does all the analytics for a big bank. Uh, one of the things he said was the the inconvenient truth is I said, well, come on, what percentage really beat the index? And he says, you know, for our general user, meaning a broad mass affluent, meaning that people will have up to, say, $2 million that they're investing. He says, let me just say nine times out of 10, they should be using a passive index. He said, but the 10 percent of the time are these thinly traded markets. And it's funny. He mentioned high yield bonds. He mentioned emerging markets. He mentioned special situations. So, you know, there is something to be said for it, but it should be used carefully. Shifting gears. A year ago, I spoke to you. Remember we did that little LinkedIn video? That was fun. And at that time, we were just talking about the book, The Only Game in Town, Central Bank's Instability and Avoiding the Next Collapse. And there were a number of things that you brought up in that conversation. I have my notes from a year ago. That's impressive. (laughs) Well, you know, I'm crazy. Uh, So one of the things that you said that there were 10 big issues that had led to excessive risk taking. I was wondering, without going through every one of those, what what do you think a year later are things that we really should be focusing on right now to ensure that the next bad thing does not happen? So the main message of the book was that the road that we were on, that was characterized by low and stable growth, by very low financial volatility by central banks being investors' best friends, and and finally, by politics being messy but not contaminating economics, that that road was going to end in the next three years. And what comes next was not yet predestined, that there were choices to be made, especially by the political system. And the reason why this road was going to end is because of inherent contradictions. And what we've seen in the last year is that these contradictions have become clearer, We've had the political contradiction, which is the rise of the anti-establishment movement, 
that has given us Brexit in the UK, that has given us the election of President Trump, that has given us an Italian referendum that failed, that has given us very exciting French elections. Exciting is one way to put it, or, it, or frightening would be the other word. Correct. Okay. We've also seen it on the financial side. At one point last year, 30% of government debt was trading at negative yields. Imagine this, Jill. It means that you lend your money to governments and you pay for the privilege of lending it. That's not supposed to happen. No. We saw major questions about what's happening to economic potential. So we saw these contradictions come out. And we saw the system pressing to tip one way or the other. I think we're still on that road. It's what I call the T-junction. The mm -hmm. road that we're on will end. But whether we come out much better off or much worse off will depend on political decisions taken, particularly in the United States and in Europe. You know, when um, we spoke, one of the things that you had mentioned was that we need to get serious about an inclusive economy. What does an inclusive economy look like today in 2017 in the United States? An inclusive economy in the United States is one that speaks to what I call the trifecta of inequality. And that trifecta is an inequality of income, an inequality of wealth, and worst of all, an inequality of opportunity. And we have seen a dramatic rise in all three inequalities. Part of it is structural in nature, but part of it is because of an incomplete economic policy response. Mm. And when, when that happens, people get angry and the politics of anger take over. And you get unthinkables becoming reality. A year ago, very few people imagined that President Trump had a chance in the Republican primary, let alone be elected president of the United States. And yet that happened. Very few people believed that the Brits would vote to exit a arrangement with Europe that has served them very well. And yet that happened. Why? Because when you get angry and when the politics of anger dominate, you also tend to become a single issue voter. Mm. And that's what we're seeing over and over again. And that's why you can look past something that you think doesn't touch your life. So you can say, well, you know, I am living in northern England and this European Union is not serving me and my wages have stagnated and all the big companies have left here. What am I going to do that you can't look past and say that eventually this might not be very good for you and see how that trickles into your daily life? That's absolutely right. And, and then we always know that that when when things aren't going well, the easiest thing to blame is outsiders. And if outsiders are foreign, that's even, even better. That's that's natural human reaction. You know, Jill, my wake-up moment on Brexit happened two weeks before the referendum. I went to visit my best friend from university in England. He is in the financial sector. He's a globalist. He's lived all over the world. He's an economist, so he knew of the risks of exiting the EU. And I said in passing, literally in passing, because I thought there was no question as to his answer, what are you going to vote? Expecting him to say remain. And he said, leave. And I said, how could you vote leave? Don't you know about this and this and this? He said, yes. But I also watch the news every night. I see the stories about all these immigrants waiting to come into this country. And I want to regain control. And this notion of regaining control was very powerful for him. And mm. he became a single issue voter. And that suddenly woke me up to the possibility that, yes, the unthinkable or the improbable could become reality. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to my interview with Mohammed El Aryan in a moment. When you hear a seasoned investor, an economist, a student of markets talking about that these unthinkable or improbable events can occur, I think we discount that. I think this is also a great thing to remember as an investor. Unthinkable or improbable events can occur, and you don't know where they come from. And that's why it might behoove you to ask yourself, if there are so many unknowns, what do I do? Well, our sponsor, Betterment, believes that they have the answer to that question. Betterment has technology that helps you plan for the future and manage your investments intelligently with special attention paid to lowering fees and minimizing taxes. Betterment checks all those boxes, globally diversified portfolio. You hear that Mohammed's talking about what's going on in the globe. 
Betterment also has automatic rebalancing and tax efficiency and great award-winning customer service. Betterment's a fiduciary, putting your best interests first. And now for those who have more complex finances that maybe they just want someone to talk to, Betterment offers two additional service plans that give you access to a team of CFP professionals. You know, I'm a CFP. And I love the CFP designation, and I think it does say something about you. In fact, I'm the CFP board senior ambassador, and I think it means something to have a CFP professional and a licensed financial expert on your side. You don't have to waste your time and your money planning for the future. Sign up through our podcast link, and you can get one month managed free. Visit Betterment.com slash off for the offer and more information. And now back to my interview with Mohammed El Aryan. So you look at Brexit, you look at the Trump administration, and by the way, the trifecta of inequality is also the case for the UK. What is their ability to enact more pro-growth structural reforms? How are they going to do this when you're sort of flapping in the wind against kind of economic theory? And as you said, inclusion in a globalized system that has actually served each of these countries incredibly well. That's correct. And, and and the silver lining here, or it's even beyond a silver lining, it's the good news, is that most economists agree on what's needed. This is not an engineering problem. The engineering of it is pretty clear. People know that we need a set of structural reforms to unleash productivity. They know that we need a more thoughtful fiscal approach. Wait, wait, let me stop again. So, What are those structural reforms? What would that look like? Infrastructure is very important. It enables the private sector to do more. Mm -hmm. And we have in this country run down our infrastructure. There's a lot that we can do with the tax system that hasn't been reformed since the mid-80s and is full of exemptions and other concessions that make it anti-growth. We haven't taken seriously education reform and human capital. We haven't done enough on labor retooling and labor retraining. There's a whole set of issues. And the irony is that both parties tend to agree on them. It's just that they they haven't been able to come together. But that's only one of the four things that are needed. Um, You also need to use fiscal policy more actively. So fiscal policy for everyone who's saying, what's the difference fiscal, monetary? Monetary is what the Fed or the central banks are doing. Fiscal is what's coming out of the government. So what are some fiscal policies that you would be cheerleading for as both an economist and an investor? So in the context of a pro-growth tax reform, I think we should be spending more on the enablers of human productivity. So infrastructure social sectors, education, that's absolutely critical. It can be done, and uh, there's room to do so in a number of countries. The U.S. is one. Germany is another one. It's running very large surpluses, and it certainly can do more. So there's scope for using fiscal policy more intelligently than what we've done so far. You know, when we talk about simplicity, it was just funny. I was on the air with an anchor who said to me, all I want is a simple tax return. Why is this so difficult? I said, I'm happy to give you that simple tax return. Are you willing to pay more for it? And then there's a stop. And as I see it, I think tax reform is really hard because there are such clear winners and losers of every single part of the tax code. And there are lobbyists on both sides. What do you think should be happening in the tax system that would obviously create a more structural, safer economy, but also be more inclusive. What is needed in the tax code? So the political dimension is really hard because, as you say, there are winners and losers. The irony are the losers, the potential losers, are those who have abused the tax system for quite a while, and they tend to be the better off segments of society. So it's not as if the losers are going to be concentrated in the most vulnerable segment of society, but you need the political courage to do so. Simplicity is important. You know, we complain about having very high corporate tax rate, but the effective tax rate is quite low. But it's unequal in terms of who benefits from it. So, So there's an element of simplicity that can actually improve the functioning of the tax system. There's an element of transparency and finally an element of predictability. I know certain CEOs that are waiting. Right. They can't make major decisions on investments that are going to pay off over five to seven years if they don't know what that tax regime is going to look like. And I was reading, so we are taping this at the end of the first quarter, but I was reading something interesting where one guy said, hey, tax rate goes from 35 to 28 
is one decision. Tax rate goes from 35 to 20 is a whole different set of decisions. The other part that was interesting is he said, and if it gets, if it's one of these weird tax changes that is 10 years sunsets and I've got to worry about what happens in the second 10 years, not so psyched about that. They want fundamental, long lasting, something, as you said, is predictable. What would be the effect net net if you said, here's Mohammed's tax plan. What's the reform? So first of all, the tax plan would be part of a comprehensive policy response that includes structural reforms, but also includes taking seriously what I call excessive indebtedness. If in, if you're in this country, you better start worrying about student loans. Mm. If you're in Europe, you better seriously deal with Greeks, debt problem, and also involves better economic architecture. So, so it's part of this four-prong approach. Um, what would it look like? It would look like simpler. Who would get hit? Carried interest, for example. For those who don't know what carried interest is, it allows hedge funds and private equity to pay a much lower tax on certain activities. I know of very few people outside that, in, that industry who think that that's a good idea. Even people in that industry sort of wink at you and know that they're getting away with murder. Correct. And they're just waiting to see when the political system is going to wake up to that. Okay, but that's a teeny thing. Should we have another tax bracket of 45% for someone who earns more than a million dollars a year? So th- there's simple things and there are things that get very controversial. Yes, I would have that. Yeah. Okay. But I also recognize that there are political trade-offs to be made and, and having a much higher marginal tax rate involves a lot of political capital. Right? Okay. I think you can you can progress a great deal by taking off certain concessions. For example, the the concession you get on mortgage interest. There you be, hate that. There should be a limit to it. There should be right. a limit to it. Right. So right? Th- you mean a dollar limit or a, a dollar or, limit? Okay. Right. It shouldn't it shouldn't benefit to the extent that it benefits people. What if you just got rid of all deductions, all exemptions, dropped rates down? You really did say, let's stop with this nonsense. You want to make it simple? Here's the simplicity. Would that work? So that would work as long as you also have things that protect the most vulnerable segments of society. It's very important to understand that there's an efficiency element to the tax system. So if you did what what you said, the efficiency element would be met. But there's also a very important redistributive element to, to, to the budgets and fiscal policy. So you need to combine both. And I think you can. Yes. I mean, you, you would have to imagine we'd work very hard to create, like, for example, a health care plan as bad as the one that we got, because it really just pissed off everyone. It was sure. unbelievable. So in your mind, if we were to kind of get the the architecture right, and we have all these different pieces, would that be enough to stimulate growth, or do you worry that we are Japan, essentially? I don't think we're Japan. I don't think there's a predestined Japan outcome for us. There are challenges. There are challenges of demography, challenges of understanding the race against the robots, if you like. What does that mean? There's the hollowing out of of the middle class. There are challenges, but we have compounded these challenges by falling short on economic policymaking. And it's not been, again, an engineering issue. It's been a political issue. We've just come out of a period since 2010 where neither party wanted to be seen to cooperate with the other side. Why? Because they were worried about the extreme wing of of their own party. And the result of that is that we got no economic legislation at a time when the world is changing very quickly. So there's a lot we can do. It doesn't mean we're going to solve everything. We sh- should be growing at 25 to 3%, not 2%. We should be pushing up our potential growth rate, not seeing it come down. So there's lots we can do. And I like that you set the bar at a reasonable level because to hear someone talk about it's going to be 4 or 4.5% is just silly, right? I mean, you cannot buy into that. So the normal... I I looked this up just for you. I think that I looked at since 1960, we've sort of bumped between, say, two and a half to three, three ish. Right. So if we were what would this economy feel like to us if we were instead of growing at two point one or two point two, we were at two eight? What would that feel like? It it will feel a lot better. It It will feel a lot better because there will be more dynamism. It also would mean wage growth would pick up. And we've had rather sluggish wage growth despite having created 16 million jobs since the worst of the Great Recession. So it would feel more inclusive. It would feel better. And importantly, we would stop the decline in potential growth. 
I worry about the next generation. They're going to inherit sluggish growth, they're going to inherit high debt, and they're going to inherit an erosion in the trust of key institutions if we're not careful. And that's why it's really important to act now. That's the end of part one of my interview with Mohammed El Aryan. And in part two, we'll learn what about the current economic, financial market conditions? What's keeping Mohammed up at night? Stay tuned. That'll be next week. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Okay, it's time for our favorite part of the show. It's your calls. Woohoo! If you've got a financial question, shoot us an email. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. That's right. It's very easy. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com and Mark will figure out how we'll get you on the air. I have nothing to do with this. We are getting flooded with requests, which is why we also have our bonus call of the week. So there's two times the chance to get on in a given week. Uh, Okay. Right now, we are going to talk to Crystal, who is on the line in Seattle. Hi, Crystal. Welcome to Better Off. What can we do for you? Hi. um, I took a new job last fall. And when I did that, I rolled over my 401k from my old job into a traditional IRA. And I've been reading about backdoor IRAs because my husband and I exceed the maximum amount um, of income that you can have to have a boss. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, um, I don't really understand the tax implications and I don't want to get hit with a huge tax bill. Yeah. um, Yeah. So um, I love this concept of the backdoor Roth. It's just kind of this cool way to get a chunk of your money taxed at current rates. Now, that said... Why would you want to pay the tax due on this right now? Well, for some people, they think their incomes are going to rise in the future. So do you and your husband think your income is going to rise? You sound like you're pretty young. How old are you? I am 37. 37. And how much do you guys make together? Together, we make 270. You think that's on the way up? Do you think that's about it? What's your guess? Probably a little more, um, Mm -hmm. but I don't think there'll be any drastic, you know, we're not going back to school or doing any of those things. Thank God. Uh, There's no back to school. So there's a couple things to consider. One of the big reasons that people like the Roth, it's that you know that you're locking in your tax liability at a specific rate. Because whether your income goes up or not in the future, you know, you might see taxes go up in the future. And what I would probably do before I were to make the backdoor Roth conversion in your case specifically is I'd wait to see what kind of tax reform comes down out of Congress. And, and you know, think about this. If you're paying an effective tax rate of I'm going to make this up, you know, let's say 30 percent on all of your income, right, because taxes are progressive rates go up. Right. And then all of a sudden you can find out that, wow, I could lock in my liability at more like 25 percent. I might convert that money. The thing is that when you convert, you've got to pay the tax that's due right now. So how much money rolled into the new IRA when you came out of your 401k? How much money's in there? It's right around ninety thousand dollars. So what would happen is you'd have to be very careful about converting this because you wouldn't want to convert so much that you're popping yourself into a new tax bracket. But whatever you were to convert into a Roth, you would then have to pay the tax on. So the big question is, do you have the cash outside of a retirement account available to pay the tax? Do you have some cash that's socked away? We do. We have about 40000 in an emergency fund. Okay. You got kids, you got house. What's going What else is going on? Yeah, we have an 18-month-old with another one on the way in July. Oh, my God. You just can't get enough. <laughs> and we have a house um, appraised at about 800000 and we owe about 570 on it. Okay. And you guys are... Um, you know, in good shape cash flow wise, like you're saving, yeah. you got, you got a new job and how much are you putting away right now into the new retirement account? Right now, my husband and I both do 10%. For me, that comes out to the 18K max. Um, for him, that's about 10K. Uh, um, well, and I'm also, well, we need to get that, that number up for him. I know. And so that was another question I had Yep, was I'm putting 5% of my income right now into an employee stock purchase plan. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seemed like I had only a couple of days to make this decision um, before the window closed. 
So I did that, and it seems like a good deal where you just get 15% return on your money yeah. at the end. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's another thing I was curious about. Is that a good long-term strategy is to keep investing in that and then use that as the remaining 5% that my husband needs to contribute? Do you, um, do you in your 401k through work, are they matching in company stock? They're not matching in stock. They match up to $1,500 a year, and then my husband has a good match program. Okay, but they don't match in stock. Nope. Okay. Uh, you know, the the thing about the employee stock purchase plans, um, what happens is you sort of get this idea like it always goes up. Of course, that didn't that doesn't always happen. So, I mean, you've made this election. How often can, can you change that election? You can decrease it one time during the six month period uh-huh. and you get a 15 percent discount off of the lower price. Mm hmm of the date of the beginning of the period and the end of the period. Here's what I would say. I don't know. I'm not going to even make you out yourself in which company you're at. Microsoft. Okay. I don't know if it is Microsoft, <laughs> but okay. Um, but if that if that were the case and you sort of get lured into this idea like, oh, I want to own some company stock, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily put 5% in. I would rather your husband be maxing out his retirement account before you start the stock purchase. And I would also prefer... Um, that you guys really are clear that, yeah, I mean, an inst- employee stock purchase plan could be great. There are tax implications because you're going to sell the stock, you get hit with taxes. It's usually short term gains. But that, you know, that's still an individual stock holding and there's risk to it because if the stock goes down, then, you know, it doesn't seem like such a great idea. Have you already started funding for college for the 18 month old? We have. We have about $3,000 in a college fund. Okay. And in a 529 college fund? Actually, no. I have a college fund at Betterment. Like that, just a fund oh, okay. set up with okay. an education goal. Okay, great. So here's here's what I, I'm going to run it down for you. Um I wouldn't blow through all of your emergency reserves to convert the IRA. I would wait to see, you know, you have some of it. I'd wait to see how tax reform shapes up and what the availability is in terms of for you guys, uh, what kind of tax break you're going to get. I would convert some portion or start converting Roth IRA, especially if rates go down. Um, I would drop my employee stock purchase plan and make sure that, number one, your husband is maxing out his 401k. So, you know, frankly, if, if that means you have to pull back the purchase plan to zero, I don't care about that. That would be fine with me. I want him to max out. And I want you guys to like sort of in your your priority list would be max out retirement. Next step would be fund college. You're going to have these two kids and, you know, you you need to put more money away. And if you've got so much money, you don't know what to do with it, (laughs) then I would say the employee stock purchase plan. Okay. Sound good? Yeah, got it. Go get them, Crystal. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Take care. Okay, that's the episode. Thanks for listening. And thanks to Mohammed El Aryan for joining us this week. Don't forget, next week, we've got part two of the interview. Don't forget, we've got our bonus episode that comes out on Tuesdays and the longer form every single Thursday. You can subscribe via iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at Jill on Money. That's at Jill on Money. Just use the hashtag better off. You can also reach me via email, askjill at betteroffpodcast.com. That's askjill at betteroffpodcast.com. And if you wouldn't mind, please leave us a review or a rating in iTunes. It really will help us out. Better Off is sponsored by Betterment. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Delercio produces. I'm Jill Schlesinger. See you next week.